next speaker will be Dr. Keith Wells, Senior Consultant, Biologics Consulting Group, who's going to take you a little bit through the product development uh, paradigm, but specifically focus on the manufacturing and regulatory issues on the development pathway. Oh, thank you all. Okay, uh, staying on the, uh, the critical path, we'll uh, have to know what the path is to begin with. Um, and some of this, uh, actually, Ellen was just uh, talking about. You, you start off in basic research. That's where some of you are. Some of you have uh, gotten to lead discovery and development, get on to the preclinical, which uh, you know, Joy will be uh, talking about uh, in a little bit. And then you get into uh, the clinical stage development. Uh, there is a continuation of that path that uh, Ellen was uh, uh, showing you. And you have to begin, as Ellen said, with the end in mind, because what you do at the outset of your development has profound impact on the consequences and results that you get later. Uh, finally, you get to the uh, FDA filing and hopefully approval. And then along the way, you get to uh, you know, talk with our colleagues uh, down at the FDA. Uh, usually, most everybody starts off with the, uh, the pre-IND meeting. I'll uh, go over some of that briefly, you know, some of what goes into a pre-IND meeting and, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, then you do the initial IND submission. If all goes well, you proceed uh, with ongoing submissions throughout the, the course of uh, clinical development. And then uh, you have uh, opportunity for an end of phase 2A meeting, um, end of phase 2 meeting. Uh, depending on the particular product and the indication, you might be able to squeeze another meeting uh, out of them. But this is generally the, uh, the format that you have up until that point. And then you get the pre-BLA meeting. This is where I'll go over what's involved with that, just again, to give you a sense of what is going to be expected from you and or your colleagues uh, in industry and elsewhere when the time comes to finally file for a, a license application for these. Market application submission, and even after that, you're not done because you have ongoing safety updates and uh, phase four commitments. So even when you think you're done, you're not done. So uh, the pre-IND meeting is usually, as I said, the first interaction that folks have with FDA. Uh, it's there to discuss your preliminary findings, review the plans that you have for development. Uh, where do you see this uh, product going for you know, uh, you know, clinical indication? Also gives you input on uh, safety testing. They're going to review uh, the manufacturing and testing plan. That's you know my particular area of expertise. Um, they want to know about the proposed design for the clinical trials and attempts you know, at dose ranging that you'll be doing either within this IND or uh, subsequent INDs. It's a type B meeting, so it's a fairly important meeting. Uh, FDA's got type A, type B, type C, and uh, this is uh, the one in the middle, which means that you get a meeting date within 60 days. So when you go to file uh, or make a request for a pre-IND meeting, it's very important that you basically have your ducks in a row because you have to provide the briefing package within 30 days of uh, your meeting date. You can't say, oh gosh, we'll get our meeting date and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll send them the stuff two days beforehand. It doesn't work that way. They'll, they'll cancel your meeting and uh, you have to uh, try again. So um, what's in the IND application? Well, uh, 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 Joy will uh, talk all about the animal pharmacology and toxicology. Uh, she'll take you through that. Also, the clinical protocols and investigator inf information. Uh, it will vary with the, the phase of the study. And basically, they want to know about the qualification of the investigators. They'll review the uh, investigational review boards, the investigators brochure. All of that will be part of uh, the IND application. And then you have the CMC. Uh, this is, um, spend a couple moments here on, on the CMC. It's where you describe the drug itself. For those of you that are doing uh, monoclonal antibodies, it's soup to nuts. Everything from uh, derivation of the uh, cell bank all the way through purification and all sorts of things in between. Uh, you know, clearance studies for you know, potential viral contaminants, etc. 
Uh, if you're doing viral vectors, they want to see, again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's not all inclusive. There's all sorts of other things. This just gives you a sense of what the type of information will be that you include in an IND application uh, for these products. Uh, for the cells, uh, this you'll have to describe cells, whether they are used as a substrate uh, for the production of vectors or for, uh, 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 well, in my case, a lot of uh, vaccines, you won't be working with those too much. Uh, but also if you're using autologous or allogeneic uh, cells, and then also, very importantly, uh, for those of you that are using feeder cells, uh, somewhere back in the lineage of your cells, they want to know about uh, uh, the feeder cells. And for that, that's the guidance that comes out of the uh, xenotransplantation guidance. And I'll give you information on all these guidance documents later. It's all available, really, uh, at, at your fingertips uh, on, the, on the FDA website. Uh, they want to know about manufacturing methods. Uh, in the case of uh, monoclonal antibodies, drug substance, drug products, all the excipients that might be in there, the cell banks, the viral seed stocks, all of that stuff needs to be described. And the important thing about it is exposure. What have these, all these different cells been exposed <coughs> to along the way? Uh, in the case, one case with feeder cells, okay, that's one thing, but also what kind of reagents have you used on the cells along the way? If you've used monoclonal antibodies, well, you have to not only describe what your cells are like, but also have to give that same kind of description that would be required for a monoclonal antibody product has to go into your description of that uh, uh, product as well. So that you can then determine what you have to do to characterize the cells? What do you have to do to demonstrate that you haven't picked up adventitious agents along the way? Um, quality control procedures are uh, uh, done at that point. Uh, release testing, the characterization that I just described uh, briefly. Uh, what kind of stability do you have on, on the material? <coughs> and very importantly, the facility information. What are you doing within the facilities that you're using to make and test your products to make them compliant with the GMPs appropriate for your stage of development. Submit the IND. They give you 30 days uh, you know, to begin the trial. Now, everybody says, oh, well, if we don't hear from them within 30 days, we're free to start. Don't. Call them. Okay. Uh, nothing hurts more than Submitting, uh, getting your 30-day uh, up at Wednesday of one week, starting your first subject on Friday, and then getting the clinical hold letter the next Wednesday. Not fun, trust me. Um, very difficult to, uh, it, it, it's an interesting uh, time when something like that happens. So you do have to let them know that you're going to, you call them up, say, hey, we're going to start, and they'll tell you, well, hold on, we, we have a couple of extra questions, or maybe not. So they'll review all of the information during that period uh, for safety and compliance. If it can't proceed safely, they're going to give you a, a hold. And it's much easier to get on hold than it is to get off. So you want to avoid hold. I'm sure some of you have already uh, experienced this along the way. I'm hearing a lot of chuckles out there and nodding of heads. Clinical testing is the next uh, uh, phase. I won't go into this uh, uh, very uh, much uh, other than it's got the three phases. This is all governed by the GC piece. Then you go into the market approval process. Again, you, you may or may not become engaged in this, but you can do the folks who are actually going to get the market applications and the approvals a big favor if you do things right, right out of the gate. Um, this is where you, uh, dis you can go to the uh, pre-BLA meeting, the pre-NDA meeting, uh, discuss all of the issues that uh, the FDA has had with your product over the years. And very importantly, learn the expectations of what they want to see in that BLA submission. Uh, this is where you iron out all of the, the commitments that uh, you say, well, you know, we, they want to see more information, 
okay, we're going to negotiate that. This is where you negotiate labels, that sort of thing. So all of that goes into that pre-BLA meeting. Then you provide all of the information uh, to determine all of this. Now, it's gotten a lot easier these days with the electronic submissions. I remember when we did uh, Verivax uh, many years ago, the vaccine that Merck had uh, uh, been developing for it was uh, 25 years at that time. Um, it was all still the old paper format, and it literally took a tractor trailer to send it all down to FDA with all of the copies that they wanted of everything. So that one, I think that was some sort of a record. Um, but anyway, this is all of the information that they're going to want to see is uh, here and some. Then you submit the, uh, the application. They've got 60 days to review it to make sure your application's complete. At that point, they can say, well, no, it doesn't have everything you committed to us, uh, to give us. So, uh, you're going to get what's called a, uh, refusal to file letter. That's not a good thing either. That causes your share price to plummet. And, uh, they can also recommend that you withdraw the application if it's bad enough. The FDA review cycles. Uh, 10 months for a standard, six months for priority. Now, some of you may be uh, going after uh, orphan designation and or a priority review, again, years from now. It's one of those things, uh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, because one of the things that they'll need to do during that uh, the review period is uh, conduct the pre-approval inspection of your manufacturing site. And you best have your manufacturing site ready to go. I've been through that. Uh, evaluations, so bring in the team leaders, division directors, office directors, all sorts of folks will sit around the table and discuss your application. May go to advisory committee. And then you get a letter back on your first action. You could come back up uh, already approved. You'll get an uh, approvable letter. You could get not approved. And then, of course, you get your license. But then you're still not done. Uh, you get ongoing surveillance, risk management. That's a big issue these days uh, uh, with uh, them giving you uh, your license, but then you have to commit to uh, these risk management uh, uh, programs afterwards. Then you get into phase four studies. Okay. So that's basically gives you an idea of all the fun waiting for you uh, in, in the coming years, whether it be you or, or your colleagues. A uh, quick review of the, the GXPs, okay. The, the only ones that really count for anything in terms of what the FDA is looking for are GLP, GMP, and GCP. They're starting to get into the, the GAMP, which is the Automated Manufacturing Practice. That's starting to you know, get a lot of uh, uh, traction with FDA. But these other ones are all sort of things that FDA kind of likes the sound of, Industry likes the sound of, everybody wants to do good stuff. So here you go. Whether it be a good engineering practice and how you design the uh, facilities, the, the equipment, etc., to make these wonderful products. Good development practice, good documentation practice. I've even seen, was it, good scientific practice. You know, everybody, it, we're all good. <laughs> so but, but where is it written? Okay, this is all available to you. Um, Basically, uh, three, uh, three groups. Basic, the, the CFR, this is thou shalt. This is, this is the force of law coming at you here. So this is where the FDA quality practices are described. The guidance by, uh, for industry documents, and there are loads of them there. You can sift through them till you, know, you're, you fall asleep at night. Uh, but there's a lot of good information in these guidance documents, and uh, particularly some of the ones that have the introductory sections are very interesting reads because it gives you a glimpse into the mindset of the FDA when they put out these documents. That and the preambles to uh, uh, a lot of the, the, the early documents are very, very informative. So it basically tells you how to do something. And then finally, the FDA has their own internal documents that say, uh, did they, when it comes time to review what you're putting in front of them. All right. Uh, Joy's going to get into uh, all sorts of uh, discussion about good laboratory practice. I'm only going to touch on it briefly to tell you, you know, what they are. Joy will do a much better job of it. 
but more importantly, what they are not, okay? It's not pre-GMP. These are all things that uh, I've accumulated over the years uh, that folks have told me what their interpretation of GLP is. Okay, it's a spirit of GMP, GMP light. Uh, it was a, uh, little r, big D, that's, that's a good one. Uh, but basically, it's not manufacturing, okay? It has really nothing to do with manufacturing, although folks in the laboratory say, hey, I want to do good stuff. So they say, all right, it'll be good laboratory practice. It's like, well, for you, yeah, it sounds great, but by you know, the regulatory uh, the definitions, no, it's not, it's not that at all. It confuses a lot of people about what the actual focus is. Basically, GLPs are there to ensure that you got a good study. GMPs are there to make sure you have a good product. All right, so elements of, uh, of CGMP. These are all described in the CFR and all of the, the guidance documents. Just touch on some of them uh, very briefly here. Um, in, for instance, uh, product production and process controls. What are you doing to maintain safety of the product uh, throughout its manufacturing? What are you doing to uh, uh, with analytical methods that you use to characterize and release and demonstrate the stability of your product? Uh, validation. Probably not something you have to deal with a lot in the early stage developments, but if you know what it is, then you'll be able to lay the foundation for validation uh, in the coming uh, uh, months and years of development. You want to build a strong foundation on bedrock. You don't want to build it out on the beach, okay, because you're going to build this massive product on top of it, so you have to make sure the foundations are sound. Um, quality control and assurance, this ranges from qualification of your vendors to the raw materials that you're using in all of your products uh, to how you release, how you review the batch records, how do you uh, release the product, how do you, uh, to the clinic, all of those things are swept in under quality control and assurance. And then very importantly, the quality management. How does, how do the, the real top people, the PIs, the investigators, the, the managers who say, we're going to go ahead, go forward with this thing, how are they interacting and how are they being informed about what's going on with the product by the people who are making it and testing it uh, in, in the trenches? Starting materials, packaging instructions, very important things, labeling, you wouldn't think labeling would be all that big a deal, but it, it's huge. And you can get massive arguments with FDA and within your own groups about what you want to have on the label. Ellen was just saying, start with the label. That's a great place to start because it tells you, it tells the person in the field when they get the product, pull it out of the freezer or the fridge or from wherever it comes, looking at it, the, the label, the package insert, okay. <laughs> This is how I handle this stuff. This is how I get it into the patient that needs it. Uh, oftentimes it's a revelation for them that says, huh, I'm not supposed to reconstitute this and then leave it around for two weeks? Like, yeah. So returns, complaints, recalls, I don't think you'll be dealing with that, but you need to have at least some way of dealing with it should it come up. All right, where did all this start? Um, this actually started way back in uh, 79 um, <clears throat> with the uh, advent of the GMPs. And everybody's been saying, well, oh, is, are, are clinical products subject to GMPs? And the, the, the short answer is yes. And it goes even back to the beginning of the concept of the GMPs. But unfortunately, they didn't give us a lot of uh, guidance on it until March of 1991. They gave us uh, the first of the uh, uh, investigational product uh, guidances. Phase one, they acknowledge very limited process validation is available for you on this. So you have to do a, a little bit more in terms of the safety testing. Whereas as you move further and further into uh, uh, product development, you get more and more into the process validation. You're validating the process. You're no longer look, you're testing the 
quality into the product. The quality is being built in as you get further down the development path. Um, 1995, they uh, provided more information in the uh, IND guidance uh, for, um, uh, for the phase one studies. Uh, there, again, they were emphasizing the validation data specifications may still be tentative at the, at the early stages. Yeah, they're willing to, to work with you on that. Then uh, 1999, they got around to the phase two and phase threes. Again, a very important concept is that of the cell bank characterization. They want to, that's something that they want to see back when you do your initial IND submission for phase one. This is not something that can wait until later. And it's very important for those that, there were some questions, I think we'll get into some of them uh, in, during the, the back and forth discussion later, the case studies. Uh, some folks were asking about, well, you know, what do we do about uh, uh, cell banks uh, you know, that may have been research cell banks and now we want to make them GMP cell banks. Yeah, there are ways that you can get to that. It's difficult, but you know, you can, it would, it would be much easier path if you pull in the information that you're going to need later at the early stages. So finally, in uh, 2008, they gave us uh, you know, the CGMPs for phase one investigational drugs, and everybody, uh, all my friends are going, <laughs> oh, they just threw uh, part 211 out. The, the, uh, the 210s and 211s are no longer applicable. No, they still apply. Uh, they may not be apl applicable in full, but what they want to do with this is foster uh, the GMP activities more appropriate for the phase one clinical studies and very, this is lifted right from uh, the guidance document itself. Very important, improve the quality of the phase one investigational drugs. Okay, so they still want quality. You can't make this stuff in your bathtub. Okay, they're still after safety being the most important thing. But the reason they did it was to facilitate more investigational drugs getting into the pipeline. I don't have it in this one, but I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen this wonderful slide where you've got this you know, big funnel of you know, 10, 20, 30,000 compounds, and at the other end you get one. Well, in order to do that, it, uh, the big gator it, it, for that is the phase ones. So you want to front load more phase ones so that you get more products out at the end. So, and this is uh, the one that replaces the 1991 guidance. Um, it's not just the US, Europe uh, requires it. And also it's uh, part of the ICH Q7A, also talks about uh, using the appropriate GMP concepts for investigational drugs. And this just gets you to the concept of the sliding scale. This is what we had all been working with and it was really the, you know, brought uh, uh, along with the, the 2008 guidance. Basically, there are some things you can't do early on and it's process validation. You're not expected to do that at that point. Uh, methods validation may be not complete. It'll be qualified methods. Um, you're developing SOPs. You're, you're just getting started. Um, some very common issues. I'm sure some of you have seen this uh, yourselves uh, out there in the field. Um, you may be making changes to the manufacturing facility. You may be trying to retrofit your research facility to make GMP material. Yeah, you can do it, it's, uh, but what are you doing to ensure that you are tr uh, compliant uh, for an appropriate phase one drug? Uh, like I said, you're not making it in a bathtub. You can make it in the research labs, but what are you doing? Are you taking and uh, how are you cleaning the, the biosafety cabinets in between batches? Are you decontaminating? Are you are you fogging it? You know, what are you doing to ensure the safety uh, of the product uh, between one patient and another? Um, just analytical method qualification. It's usually a scaled down version of what is expected later on in development. But again, very, very important that you lay the groundwork early on with the analytical methods because you don't want to make costly mistakes later if you, if you make your material, run your phase one, everything looks great, and then you go to run your phase two, and all of a sudden, it's not working the same way. Well, is that because the 
science was bad? Maybe. Was it because the product wasn't adequate? Could be. Was it because the analytical method was faulty? If you don't, if you've not done the analytical qualification early on, you don't know where to start. And that, that causes uh, very significant delays in development. You don't have to do the whole uh, gamut of the ICH uh, guidelines, uh, just a subsection of it. And it's up to you to decide which sections you, uh, which parts of that you're going to do. Um, this is a, uh, was provided uh, to me by a, a colleague of mine. And I think this really gets to the heart of what some of you folks are, are dealing with here. And it's the transition of you know, high caliber academic researchers to product developers. Okay, you know, we were all trained by good mentors. We know how to design experiments. That's why we all got those letters after our names. You know, we all stood in front of that uh, committee that one uh, horrible day and uh, for several hours and you know, we show them that we know how to design and interpret studies. Um, some folks, they'll continue in that vein. Others can't get away from it fast enough. Um, and usually it's because they don't want to be burdened by the paperwork. Uh, they've got too much time constraints. They've got other things to do. Do it. It's important. And I'll, in some of the, uh, the more interactive portion of this, I'll show you why it's so important. Um, folks make very unsubstantiated assumptions about the nature of the reagents and the materials. Uh, it, it, it matters, okay? It matters that you write down lot numbers of sera and media and reagents. I'll give you an example from my own very painful past. Um, well, actually, it wasn't too painful because we did the right thing. When I first started out, we were doing some work, and the guys from uh, Research uh, Quality Assurance showed up one day and said, you guys have got to start writing all this stuff down. And, of course, why? It's, it's, it, it's, it's delaying the progress. I said, well, we might need the information later. Why? They said, just do it. Like, all right, fine. So we started writing it all down. We were writing down uh, lot numbers of serum. And this was back in uh, the early 90s. And this was for seed stocks for a vaccine that is now marketed. And they were getting ready to do clinical studies uh, within about the six to nine month time frame after that. And uh, but that's, they're just getting ready to submit the IND. I think they, no, they had submitted the IND and they had actually started dosing some subjects. And all of a sudden, uh, at my lab uh, door appeared uh, some very nervous looking guys from QA uh, saying, hey, did you do what we told you to? Did you write down the lot numbers of the serum that you used uh, back to make these seed stocks? And I said, yeah, I did. And they said, oh, where are they? So they went through it and they looked and looked. And I said, what is all this about? And they said, well, we just heard from our supplier that they found a new virus in some of the serum that hadn't been discovered before. And FDA is very nervous about it. And fortunately, we had written it down. And also, thank God, we, uh, it, it, we weren't using any of the suspects here, which is even better. Um, if we had not done that, had not bothered to write it all down, guess who was going to have to go through all of the records from all of the shipments of all of the sera for a multinational biopharmaceutical company in order to determine if he had used uh, the wrong sera in his uh, seed stocks. This was not the day of the internet. We didn't have electronic records. This was looking at the old files in a warehouse. You know how many hours that would have taken would have been excruciating. So write it all down. And it's important to write it down for the guys who are going to pick this ball up when you, you know, pass it to them uh, down the line. It's going to make their lives a lot easier. And it's going to increase the value of the product that you turn over to them. If they don't have to go back and remake cell banks and seed stocks because you've kept good records, they're, not going, to, they're going to keep all of the zeros attached to that offer letter that you guys get. So, um, di primary documentation, okay. 
just here are some of the uh, principles for quality practice for you to consider. Again, write it all down. It, 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 it's valuable information. Uh, technology transfer practices, that'll come into play when you begin to take the products that you guys are developing and pass it along to those that will come after you. Just to give you a, a sense of where all of this belongs and who's in, concerned with it, legal affairs, actually a lot of this documentation practice is very important uh, uh, for the attorneys, whether it be for patents or for other uh, legal activity later. It's often as important as uh, you know, product development uh, for the clinic. Okay, the different phases, the uh, research phase, there's, in terms of GMPs that are required, there's essentially none at this stage, but maintain good house uh, uh, practices. Use the basic frameworks that, you, that comes out of the GLPs, okay? Make sure the data are accurate and verifiable, documents are traceable, all of that. You're starting to put together documentation practices for SOPs, you know, rudimentary batch records, et cetera. The emphasis is on the sound data, and as I said, the future patent position for you guys might be as important uh, as uh, compliance with GMPs. When you get to the preclinical phase, again, essentially none. Uh, recommend, though, that the, uh, the materials that you make uh, are uh, made according to GMPs because it makes Joy's life a lot easier when you don't have to go to the FDA and prove that the material that you made for the clinic is the same as that that you're making for the, uh, uh, the preclinical uh, 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 safety testing. Tox, tox uh, testing, phase one, phase two. GMPs are applied, but you've got that, you're dealing with that sliding scale. Uh, phase threes, by then you're pretty much, uh, this is the big leagues. Uh, when you get to phase three, this is where full compliance with GMP is an expectation. And then, a, so in conclusion with that portion of it, the GMP uh, compliance is, uh, is required. They develop with the product. All right, I'm just gonna give you these two slides real quick, uh, more for shock value than anything else. There you go. Like, ah, <laughs> we gotta do all this? Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Long and the short of it is yes. I'm not going to go through it all, uh, but it gives you, you said, some of you, again, you, some of you are not going to be worried too much about viral clearance processes unless you're doing monoclonal antibodies or other therapeutic proteins that are made in, uh, you know, Cho cells, for instance, and what have you. Um, just gives you a sense of where you are. Again, these are not hard and fast rules. They're just to, for you to consider where you ought to be with the development, all, all these little uh, various aspects. And then at the bottom is uh, establish interim specifications. The specifications, I'll just take a moment with that. The specs are actually the contract that you've got with the FDA. When you tell the FDA we're gonna have these specifications, you're essentially entering into a contract with them and saying, this is uh, uh, what we're gonna do to release the product. And you know, like everybody else, they're not gonna be too happy with you if you breach your contract. And again, this is the analytical R&D in QC CMC. Again, not gonna spend a, a lot of time. You can read this at your leisure. Okay, th th I love this one. This one, I get, I get this a lot <laughs> uh, over the years, and I've accumulated them. And each one of these I, I've heard from somebody. Our product is different. Sure it is. They're all different. It's too complex. That's, so we, we, we can't do all of this because it's too complex. We already know everything there is to know about it. Okay, sure. Um, we already know the process is sound. Yes, until the next week they try to make it and it falls flat on its face. Uh, confident the methods will work, same story. Not technically possible. Okay, that's a great one. Um, there's some real, there's some good ones in here. Didn't know we were going to have to submit this. <laughs> I, 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 you've heard it, okay. Too difficult. Well, life's hard, people. Come on. <laughs> this is, yeah. The, the, the barriers are high, but the rewards are great. Come on. 
Uh, this was a great one. We're scientists. Yes, yeah, so am I. <laughs> Uh, it, it, I, okay, it, we all love to publish. Okay, and uh, but you still got to audit the data. You still got to have QA take a look at the data and make sure it's accurate and verifiable. Okay, yeah, I've been on editorial boards. I'm sure you guys have. Very few people who sit on the editorial boards actually go and check the source documents. I mean, I never did it. And I think it's, you know, you, we've all seen what happens in, in the literature nowadays with everybody retracting every other paper that comes out. Management won't allow us. Well, that's a good one. That's a real problem right there. We just want to get through phase two. There, there is life beyond phase two, okay? And if you know, acknowledge that there is life beyond phase two, uh, life at phase three and beyond gets a lot easier for folks. And as I said, you're going to be doing yourselves, your future commercial partners, and everybody else who's uh, vested in this a, a, a big favor if you pay attention to the, the little things early on. Reviewer, this is one I got from somebody who was in a phase two situation. They didn't, didn't get asked about something during phase one, so they thought life was good. Well, just because the reviewer didn't ask about it the first time, you know, they, they get another crack at you as you go forward. Okay, the FDA really wants this product. Not nearly as much as you do. Okay. So, all right, here are some illustrations, very brief examples of uh, what happens if you believe such nonsense. Um, now this, I'm sure uh, Joy's got some other lovely, so non-compliance with GLP. This was a, this was a good one. Uh, they took the sample, and instead of doing what everybody else in the industry does with a sample of this type, which is immediately process it and test it, or store it overnight, maximum overnight for two to eight degrees. They went ahead and said, hey, you froze, freezing it should be good. Sure, freezing fixes everything, except not for this one. So they had a, uh, a the, the tox test results were uninterpretable. And it, they had to do a nine month test, and then not only that, they had to do a second nine month long tox test. 18 months delay. I don't know if Ellen and uh, her colleagues are going to be too happy with you if you say, uh, we, we messed up and uh, we're 18 months behind. So, okay, non-compliance uh, non GMP, okay. Again, uh, container closure studies, okay. They were going to, st this one, it was going to be uh, minus 20 storage. So they didn't show that the particular container closure there, they didn't know that the particular container closure that they had was subject to shrinkage of the stopper during storage at minus 20. And so thus, they could not verify that they still had a sterile material. And so the FDA put them on clinical hold and it caused a, a nine month delay. This program almost got canceled. Uh, they didn't take enough sample. Now this one actually may be something that you guys have to deal with because some of your batches are so small. And since the time that uh, this one happened, uh, you, uh, the methods have evolved and you can get away with smaller samples uh, for good reason. And I think it's been really the cell therapy uh, and the, uh, the, the personalized medicine folks who've really driven this because their sample sizes are so small they just can't take the, 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 the massive amounts of volume that need to go into a sterility test. But, these guys at the time, it just goes to show that you have to think all of these things through because they didn't have enough for the viral safety. And again, this one almost got canceled with an eight month delay. Okay, gonna uh, be wrapping up here uh, in a couple minutes. So very uh, important questions for you guys to ask yourselves. And, and uh, it's time, you know, when you get along the way here, the question is to ask and things to do is be honest with yourselves, okay. Are you really ready for the next big milestone? What is the next big milestone? Are you going into uh, first in man studies, filing an IND? Are you a little further back uh, in uh, with preclinical? Uh, and define what you need to do to be at that the particular uh, stage. Conduct the honest assessment, okay? Are your methods ready uh, to uh, for that particular phase? Do you have your materials all uh, uh, ready to go. 
Do you have some manner of control over the process? I mean, it's tough you know, for a lot of these things uh, at this early stage, but do you have some manner of control? And I hit the paperwork in order. This is the, uh, the history of uh, uh, the cell lines. Uh, where have they been? What have they seen? You know, what kind of conditions were they processed under? So that you get an idea of what may have come along for the ride. Okay, so that you can characterize and make sure that you're not uh, it, uh, bringing along adventitious agents. And again, can't emphasize this enough that the decisions early on have got big implications later. Your mistakes will come back to haunt you, okay? Um, and then you can determine when do you need to accelerate. There are opportunities to accelerate parallel development uh, where you might need to uh, step back and uh, uh, rest for a little bit. And then always, always remember that keep the end goal in mind. The end goal is to get these products to the patients that need it. And that's why we're all here. Where do you get the help? FDA. They want to talk to you. Okay, they've got uh, uh, people who, uh, in their small business uh, uh, divisions, you know, they'll uh, they can provide assistance. The guidance documents are there, uh, free for the asking. ICH has got a lot of very good information. Again, that's all free. WHO has got uh, information. Even USP, I think you have to pay for USP, but they've got some very good ideas on uh, analytical development and. Uh, the methods and things like that. CERM, you know, your the colleagues in this room are another great source of information. Consultants, hey, you know, shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> uh, vendors, uh, if you're using CMO, a CMO that is specializes in the manufacturing of the cells that you're interested in, they may have some uh, pointers for you, but again, uh, as with everything else, you know, caveat emptor, you know, don't probably best to confirm what they have to say, but they may provide you with some information. And that is it. I think I have time for a couple of questions and then we'll have some later on. Yes? And there's a microphone, so just wait for it. Right here. Um, I'm going to ask a question I ask almost every time I can find an expert in the room. And that is, a lot of us are planning. Are <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. Right Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> See, that's the problem with microphones. Okay. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> we're interested in knowing or getting some advice about what vectors to use to reprogram cells, okay. uh, what method for reprogramming. Uh, do some uh, reprogramming factors make the FDA more nervous than others? Do some methods make the FDA more nervous than others? Right. And uh, I get that question a lot. Uh, I had a client last year that was absolutely furious with me that I could not tell them exactly what vector to pick, what cell line to pick, what plasmid to pick, what you know regulatory elements to put into plasmid, uh, because everything is fair game. Okay, there are some that the FDA has seen and is not too keen on, and then there are others that are well-trodden paths. Okay, uh, but I, I remember at a, uh, uh, a meeting the uh, World Vaccine Congress a few years ago, and I was on a panel with uh, Phil Krauss uh, from FDA, and Phil's a, an old friend from many, many years ago. And uh, I decided to put him on the spot, and Phil's, Phil's big, uh, 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 area of expertise is uh, cell bank characterization. And I, I uh, put him on the spot and I said, Phil, I asked him the same question. Basically, is there a cell bank or is there a cell line that the FDA just won't, won't even look at? And he said, anything is fair game. He said, short of coming to him with as he put it, what was it? Neuronal tissue from a scrapie infected sheep. Uh, <laughs> that was about it. And, uh, but everything, I, I have seen cells that I never thought in a million years would pass muster. But the data that were there to support its use were sound. The FDA bought into it and away they went. And I've seen people you know, essentially blow it with Cho cells. You know, it was just, they had not done their homework. They thought, ah, Cho, pff, off we go. 
Like, well, no, they, it, they do want to see that you've done all the investigations that you're supposed to do with all of these things. Turns out that the CHO that got balanced, they had used serum early on in the development phase from, you know, you guessed it, uh, Europe back in, uh, you know, once upon a time in the, in the 80s sometime. So I can't tell you exactly which ones to use uh, to borrow from you know, Kenny Rogers. Uh, every cell's a winner, every cell's a loser. Uh, uh, so it's up to you to provide the data. And actually, what the strategy would be to, if you're thinking of something, go to the FDA when, at your pre-IND meeting. You'll be describing, they'll, they'll be expecting you to describe, you know, the vectors, the plasmids, give them the maps and the sequence analysis and everything else. And they'll, they'll put it through its paces and you, you go to them and say, this is what we intend on using throughout the course of our, our product development. Does the FDA agree? And they'll, they'll tell you. you know, they'll say, we have concerns about that. Or they may come back and uh, uh, silence. I, I, I went to them one time you know, just knowing in my heart of hearts that they were going to come back and say, no, we don't like this. This it had to do with uh, oh, a, uh, an affinity tag that had been put onto a, pro a protein product. I knew they were going to come back and give us uh, grief about it. And... I put right in the questions, we intend to use this throughout the course of product development into license. Does the FDA have any objections? There was silence on it. Turns out that they had already seen a similar product and had approved and had allowed it to go forward and they had, you know, vetted it and all that. So, so, yeah. so I have a question over here. Yes. Um, so you talked about a lot about IND to later stage. Can you make some comment about from early translational study to IND? What should we really pay attention to? Early in translation, uh, the best thing you can do for yourself is f uh, focus on the analytical methods. Okay, I, I can't emphasize that uh, enough. Sound analytical tools that you can use to follow your product as it develops throughout the course of you know, history are going to uh, provide very, very big dividends for you. Develop a, a sound analytical method you know, for potency. I know potency is a big issue uh, with a lot of these things. You know, uh, But something that is going, uh, because the data that come out of the uh, analytical methods, okay, they are what you're building everything upon. Okay, So if you've got sound methods, and good reference standards and have done some of the qualification of the methods. Uh, I would emphasize that you know, pretty much more than anything very early on. You know, I know everybody wants to get out and make the stuff. You know, I'm a manufacturing guy myself, so I love making it and you know, testing always used to seem to slow me down, but it's what you're relying upon uh, to get you where you need to be you know, in the future. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. Yeah, the last one, and then we need to move on. Oh, okay. Um, there's a concept that many people offer, which is that it's different because it's an academic IND. And usually you want to say, well, I hope it's an academic patient then. <laughs> um, so the question I have is, is there enough experience now, for, starting with university settings, which most of us are, yeah. in some type of a template as how you transform the you know, hospital slash lab experience with the exposures that your know, products might have had early on that you can't necessarily quantify yeah. or calibrate for adventitial virus, et cetera, yeah. um, that you have a way to transform this into a truly regulated data set that you would feel is worthy of an IND coming from academia or industry? Yeah, would you, yeah I, I have to point out, I don't do a lot with academic INDs. Okay, that, that's not something I tend to work with. But uh, in in... The analogy I can draw is a lot of the therapeutic proteins, a lot of vaccines, and all those sorts of things, the seed stocks and everything else have got very humble beginnings, okay, in academic labs stretching back decades. And trying to, when you're trying to pull all of that into an IND, uh, you may have to go trace back all of those reagents, and that's where you get 
head off to the archives and all that. Uh, find out what they've been exposed to. Try and pull it up to the rigor of a, uh, you know, a standard IND, if you will. Uh, that's about the only thing I can suggest. It's a, it's not impossible. Okay, it's going to be a difficult task, but you can, you can do it. I've seen people pull it off. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, QA people can do it. Um, you can. Uh, the best thing to do is you know, bring the team in and say, "Hey, we've got to go. We've got to scour through all this literature that we've established." You know, again, serum, media, salt solutions, excipients, supplements that were used. All of that needs to be brought. And and sometimes you just come up short. But you go to the FDA and say, this is what we've got. What do you think? They, they say, we're not comfortable with it. But a lot of times they say, all right, in that case, run a few, here are a few extra tests you might want to consider doing, okay, that you hadn't thought before. That then they say, if you give us, if that's all clean, you know, go ahead uh, and, and, and get it into people. Okay, thanks so much. Sure, okay. Thank you.